Like, Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our 52nd Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75-week-long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority will be taking the celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence, The People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. They are currently in week 52 of this celebration, with the Blight Stragopan as the species in focus and the Nagaland Zoological Park as the zoo in focus. This year also mark this week also marks the marks one year conclusion of our celebration our, our celebration on the outreach campaign that began last year on March 20, March 12, 2021. So with this, we without further ado, we go towards our first segment, which is the Know Your Species part, with for which we have with us Dr. Rahul Kaur, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the from the Wildlife Trust of India. Dr. Rahul has done his doctorate on the ecology of the cheer pheasant from the University of Kashmir and has over three decades of experience in the field of wildlife conservation. He has also worked as a member of several national and international animal welfare and conservation bodies. He's, the co he's also the co-chair of the IUCN SSE Galliform Specialist Group and will and will share with us today on the will share with us today on the conservation status of the species in focus so dr rahul was supposed to join us live for the session but due to some unavoidable circumstances he wouldn't be joining us live but has shared his shared his presentation with us which we will be live which will broadcast to you now so Uh, Namaskar to all of you. Uh, I feel honored to have been asked to make this presentation in front of you. Uh, in connection with the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa, uh, commemorating India's uh, 75th year of independence. Uh, I would have loved to uh, make this presentation live in front of you, but uh, due to my travel schedules, I'm traveling that very day. Uh, I have been asked by the organizers, organizers to record it, and therefore uh, uh, this recording. Uh, since I'll not be able to answer your question, so please uh, write in if you have any queries uh, on the email that I am sharing with you. Uh, Now, uh, I'm going to talk on uh, the Blatt Stragopan. Uh, and uh, this species is apt for the theme of uh, uh, this series of talks, uh, which is conservation to coexistence, the people connect. What better example of this theme than uh, the Blatt Stragopan? And I'll explain uh, that. Uh, during the course of my talk. So, Blatt Stragopan. Uh, of the five species of Stragopans uh, that uh, occur globally, four are found in India. Uh, the, the one that is found uh, in China, and not found in India, is the Capus Stragopan. Now, uh, within India, you have, uh, as I said, the four species. Uh, the ones depicted in yellow uh, is the Western Tragopan. You see, it's found in the western part of the Himalayas, uh, right across JNK and Himachal, and uh, entering a part of Uttarakhand. 
then the one in the blue is the satire Jagopan that goes across Uttarakhand, uh, Nepal, uh, Sikkim, <clears throat> and uh, Bhutan, and into some parts of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, the one in uh, green is uh, the, the Timming Stragopan, uh, which is found in most, most of uh, um, the Arunachal Pradesh state. And uh, then the red one is the Blad Stragopan that is found in Arunachal and down into uh, the hills, uh, the northeastern hills of, of, of Kasi and uh, Jayantia. Now, if you look at uh, the global distribution of Blad Stragopan, uh, as you see, uh, it's found in little uh, parts of Bhutan. Uh, then right across Arunachal, uh, and a little bit goes into China, and then down into uh, uh, Mizoram, uh, Nagaland, and a little bit of Manipur, and then also into Myanmar. Now, uh, this is a, a, a tragopan species that is slightly different from the others uh, found in the Himalayas because it's found a little lower down. Uh, the altitude range is 1800 to 2600 meters and that's probably the reason why it's also found in the the hills of the northeast rather than the real himalayas up in arunachal pradesh it inhabits uh, primary moist evergreen forest and its evergreen uh, its, its uh, threat status is vulnerable as per the iuc threat list Uh, however, I think uh, this this needs an upgrade because, as you see, the global range is so small, uh, and uh, that too, as you will become aware through my presentation, uh, it's it's quite patchy, and therefore the the real uh, or the area of occupancy is is so small. It, it deserves to be kind of upgraded to uh, endangered. Now the distribution in India, uh, as I was just not saying, it's patchy in, uh, in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, it's, it's known from just two sites. So, so Eagle's Nest in the West and Meha Wildlife Sanctuary in the East. And there's a large chunk of habitat which is uh, perhaps largely unexplored for this species and therefore we have very little uh, documentation of this species occurring uh, across uh, this uh, mountain range in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, then down uh, into Nagaland, uh, Nagaland uh, it's largely found in in three areas, uh, Konoma, uh, then Seochung, which, which is the Satoi, and the Saramati Hill Range. Uh, this map actually misses out uh, Mizoram, uh, where it's found in the Blue Mountain uh, National Park, uh, which is quite adjacent to uh, Myanmar. We have not had any uh, reports of uh, uh, this species occurring in uh, Myanmar, but uh, again, it could be lack of surveys or, or perhaps areas that are very close to Nagaland might inhabit, uh, might have some of these uh, species or this species. Now, uh, if you remember, uh, I, I told you about uh, this species occurring in uh, Bhutan as well. Uh, so, so in the southeastern part of Bhutan, uh, a, a species, a subspecies called called Molsworthy was described, uh, uh, but uh, it's 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 not been seen recently. Uh, this Molsworthy is is quite distinct from. Uh, 
type specimen that was described uh, from uh, Nagaland. And, uh, and therefore, uh, earlier authors had, I would say, speculated that, that uh, Brahmaputra is probably the, the dividing line and areas north of Brahmaputra would actually hold the moles worth it. And the area south of Brahmaputra would hold the type specimen, that is the Blythei Blythei. Now, uh, these are five photographs that have been taken from five areas. Mehau and Eagle's Nest are the areas in Arunachal Pradesh, which is north of Brahmaputra. Pakim is Saramati, Konoma, and Syochum, which is Satoi. Uh, in Nagaland. So these three sites are from Nagaland, Mehau and Eagles, this is from Arunachal. And uh, as you see, all these birds look similar. There's no physical difference in these birds. So, so technically, Mehau and Eagles Nest also has Blythe, Blythe, rather than both. Now, uh, we conducted a, 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 a census of, of uh, Blyats back in 2016 and 18, and there's some pre preliminary results. And these are kind of uh, call count points in Konoma, call count, count points in uh, Satoi, and then call count points in the Saramati range. As you say, Saramati is a much larger habitat. Uh, and uh, much better dispersion of this uh, species. Now, uh, if you look at density indices of, of uh, this bird across Nagaland, uh, because Arunachal, we have no estimates of density. Uh, in Nagaland, uh, the, 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 the index ranges from 4.8 to 1.4. Uh, and uh, in Nagaland, as I said, uh, there, uh, sorry, in, in Mizoram, there's a site, uh, the Blue Mountain, and that also has uh, uh, plats at a density of approximately one uh, per square kilometer. And these are basically calling groups. Uh, so, uh, because the estimation is done by using call counts, and therefore one uh, uses calling groups rather than an individual. We don't know whether there are two birds there, or there's a male or female there, or there's a male, and therefore we call it a calling group. So uh, Mizoram has around one calling group per square kilometer, and the others in Nagaland have slightly more. Now, uh, we did a, a, a kind of a, a, a maxim to to uh, figure out the probable distribution of of blights across uh, Nagaland, and as you see, uh, the area uh, of suitability is very small. Of course, it is limited by, as I said, the altitude. And uh, only the the areas with that altitude and that kind of forest uh, appear to be occupied or appear to be probable sites of of distribution. Now uh, that was status. Now threats uh, threats they're no different from other species. Uh, and uh, I think I think the most threat to uh, the species is uh, uh, habitat. Arunachal, it's not lack of habitat. Arunachal, we don't really know. Uh, but uh, in Arunachal, uh, to a normal species, uh, shifting cultivation on Zoom is seen to be a threat. But I don't think it's too much of a threat to the species because these birds are small and they don't need very large contiguous areas to survive. Uh, yet, 
uh, locally wherever there is zoom uh, the birds will probably be eliminated from there or they would move to 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 more forested areas in adjacent sites uh, felling is no longer now a threat uh, it seems but uh, in certain parts it, it, it is uh, but it's largely uh, my concern largely is uh, is uh, the lack of uh, suitable areas in nagaland and that seems to be at the moment uh, the stronghold of the species uh, hunting uh, does happen uh, and we have had instances of, of hunting uh, because after all it's it's belongs to the chicken family and uh, and it is uh, snared largely sometimes shot also for, for meat uh, now i think conservation uh, and that is where i would kind of want to uh, uh, spend a little more time uh, in Nagaland, where we know uh, this species uh, occurs and occurs uh, in a few locations, uh, community participation is the key uh, here. Uh, because in, in Nagaland, uh, only less, just, just about less than 2% of the forest is actually uh, managed by the state forest department. So most areas are under community owned or community managed. And therefore, unless uh, we involve local communities and make them partners in conserving this species, uh, I don't think there's a future. Uh, people, local communities in Kanoma and Satoi, Surhuru, Tanamir, and Wong Su Wong, uh, they've already uh, declared areas uh, for tragopans. And I, I think this is an extremely uh, positive and encouraging step. Uh, and I think they need to be supported. Uh, because, because otherwise, where will the forest department, if, if they want to, uh, conserve the species where will they conserve the species it has to be in these areas and these areas are community participate community managed so so i think uh, whether uh, declaring these areas as uh, community conserved areas or in whatever form uh, and and uh, the communities actually uh, i would say compensated but uh, made integral to, 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 to management and also uh, being made su sustainable somehow in terms of payments. Uh, I, I think that is the way to go forward. The conservation breeding has been a, a, a thing that's been kind of uh, discussed and, and offered as a panacea for all Kind of species that are that are uh, threatened. Uh, now, uh, blast tragopan actually has had a long history of of, of conservation breeding, and that it was called captive breeding then at that time. Uh, when back in I think 1983, uh, uh, some birds were transported to UK uh, for safekeeping and. Uh, and then in you, I think some forest officers of Nagaland were trained in, in, in captive breeding in the UK. Uh, and that started a history of, of conservation breeding program in Nagaland, uh, uh, which till now is running. Uh, it's kind of uh, gone up and down. Uh, there have been instances where uh, they have, the, the center has, has produced uh, success in terms of chicks surviving and to adulthood. But there also have been uh, kind of uh, years where uh, uh, there's been uh, drought and 
there's been loss of uh, captive birds and all. So, so uh, at the moment, I I think uh, there's a, there's a there's a talk uh, along with alongside this one uh, where some forest officer from Nagaland will probably be talking about and 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 maybe you'll get the recent figures or the numbers from from him or her, uh, but but. Uh, until the time I know of, there were six males and six females in, in the conservation breeding center. Uh, and, and one uh, chick had survived to uh, a juvenile stage. Uh, so so uh, realistically, uh, this is a good Founder stock because what we have seen in, in most conservation breeding projects is that uh, we lack founder stocks and therefore the, the project or the attempt falls through. At least here we have a, a breeding stock available. However, what is the problem with uh, most of our conservation breeding projects and, uh, and this is uh, this has been uh, kind of uh, it's come to the fore very often uh, is that uh, we uh, don't either understand or are not uh, prepared to uh, take it on long term uh, conservation breeding and uh, its its uh, effect on in situ populations uh, is a long term process, uh, and therefore, therefore it has to be basically driven as such. Uh, the other issue that, that very often I have seen in the forest department. Conservation, conservation breeding projects is they are not target driven. Uh, by target driven, what I mean is that uh, we have to set targets as birds, not not shooting targets. How many birds we have in how many years is should be the target rather than how much money have have I spent or how many aviaries have I made. If that if if we if we drive targets which are birds that in five years I must have five surplus birds and in ten years I must have fifty surplus birds, then uh, the whole plan revolves around that target. Uh, what I have seen really is uh, is that uh, we'll talk about financial outlays and financial targets being met and physical targets being met. Uh, but but the birds, their survival and their production and productivity, that becomes secondary. And therefore, uh, it, before, before starting, it becomes a, a no-show. Also, also, the way the projects are run at the moment, uh, uh, and the way the forest department is structured, uh, it it doesn't lend to long term uh, engagement of a single team or or a, a continuous leadership or even uh, continuity in the team uh, because because that is how uh, the forest departments uh, run their affairs is uh, because. Uh, people change. People get posted away, and and a new team comes in. So so therefore, I think it is it is extremely important that uh, uh, the project is taken up in uh, uh, a, a proper project mode, uh, where we know that fine after at the end of ten years uh, we'll have. This many birds, and and this is where we're going to release them, and this is how we're going to monitor them. 
so all that is is uh, is is function of planning and and uh, and technical partnership for those plans that therefore becomes extremely important technical partnership brings in two aspects one is uh, that because it is technical partnership uh, so therefore all the technicalities of of conservation breeding because conservation breeding is especially if you're talking about galliforms uh, it's it's not they are chicken but it's not chicken breeding so 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 uh, so therefore uh, it it is a, a lot more uh, delicate than chicken breeding and therefore it, it, it's a lot more intricate in that sense and therefore uh, it needs people who have done this in the past who have succeeded in this in, at this in the past uh, to be able to contribute and help to achieve that target that we have set technical partnership also brings in that uh, continuity that i was talking about uh, might be actually lacking in uh, the systems of the forest department. So, so in summary, really, uh, uh, Blatt Stragopan is is something that is uh, it's uh, a species with a very small global range, uh, largely known from Nagaland. Uh, and uh, with a large potential range in our natural, which is relatively unknown. Uh, and therefore, uh, forest department must initiate surveys, the natural forest department must initiate surveys to basically figure out uh, their status as regards this bird. So, uh, this is largely true for Nagaland that uh, the, the limited range has a very small area of occupancy, uh, and and I uh, would would uh, not hazard a guess uh, as to how how much how small in terms of uh, square kilometers, but it is it is extremely small, uh, and uh, and these small fragments basically are prone to local extinctions and therefore uh, they need to be handled extremely carefully. Uh, again, I emphasize on community, community integration uh, is, is imperative for this. And, and therefore, when I was talking about uh, the, the theme of this uh, series is conservation to coexistence and the people connect. Uh, this is a golden opportunity, actually, to to connect people with conservation. Uh, the Nagas actually have, because it's a state bird, and and they have. Uh, I think they are very proud of the state bird, and uh, and they have set aside areas. Kodama, for instance, as I said, uh, is about a hundred square kilometers uh, of, of very good contiguous forest, uh, which which would make an excellent a reserve for blood struggle uh, but it is it is uh, under the community management therefore they have to be taken on board likewise saramati uh, is about 200 250 square kilometers of contiguous forest uh, and uh, there might be few stakeholders there but uh, all those need to be engaged and and therefore uh, an excellent opportunity uh, to to uh, uh, make the community as partners in conservation and uh, and in case in case uh, this species is to be recovered uh, as i said uh, it is uh, more likely to be uh, endangered rather than vulnerable uh, in terms of the iuc classification and it has if it is to be brought back to vulnerable i think uh, it needs a long term uh, plan, long-term commitment, and long-term analysis. Uh, the role of conservation breeding uh, is there. Uh, 
really. But but again, as I said, uh, unless you have a community, where will you release the birds? Once you once you produce enough birds uh, for release, so these areas are community managed. Therefore, the two have to be uh, done in sync. Uh, the conservation breeding producing uh, surplus birds for release and uh, the communities uh, in their uh, set aside areas, the reserve areas, protecting these, their state bird. Uh, it's a wonderful kind of uh, opportunity to be a part of this initiative. So thank you very much. I, 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 I think this is all I had to say. And, uh, and in case, uh, as once again saying that uh, this is uh, really an opportunity for discussion, but uh, I can't be there. Uh, so, so any uh, questions that, that you might have, please uh, feel free to get back to me on my email and I'll, I'll try and answer these questions. Thank you very much. Right. So, the, uh, uh, so that that was the talk on the blight strike pan. We now move on to our second section for today's talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So, we're joined in today to speak to us on the zoo is Dr. Zupini uh, Sanglai, who is the director of the Nagaland Zoological Park. Dr. Zupini is an Indian Forest Service officer of the 2013 batch. She's a veterinarian by training and has worked in the field of veterinary research prior to joining the Forest Department. She will speak to us today more on the Zoom in Focus. So over to you, Matt. Would you like me to share the presentation for you? Okay. Should I go ahead, ma'am? We will share ourselves from here. Okay. All right. All right. Shall we start? Yeah, ma'am, if you can just put it in the slideshow mode. Is it fine? Uh, it's no? not yet in the slideshow mode. Okay, okay I'll give it now. Yes, it's fine. Fine. Hello. yes, it's fine. fine. Please proceed. Yeah, very good afternoon, everyone, to all the participants. The Nagaland Zoological Park uh, is very thankful to the Central Zoo Authority of India for giving us this opportunity for choosing our plight tracker pen as the species of the week. Uh, for today's program, also, we would like to thank Dr. Rahul Paul, CEO. WDI, co-chair of IUCN, SSCA, Kelly Forms Specialist Group, 
for giving his input on our state bird blitz tracker brand. I would like to give a short presentation on our Zoo Nagaland Zoological Park. First introduction, our Nagaland Zoological Park is located around eight kilometers from the commercial city of Dimapur in the state of Nagaland with a total area of around 176 hectares. It was officially inaugurated in 8 August 2008 from Rangapahar Wildlife Sanctuary. And this zoo is considered, our zoo is considered or categorized as a medium zoo by Central Zoo Authority of India. At present, the park has a collection of about 361 captive wild and life comprising of mostly of mammals, birds and reptiles, which are indigenous to the region, including a number of threatened and endangered species. The objectives of our Nagaland Zoological Park is as such, one, first one is ex situ conservation program for the flora fauna of northeastern India and Nagaland in particular. Another is our in initiate the captive breeding of endangered species which are found in our region. And third is promoting zoo as an institute for conservation awareness education program for the people of the state and thus enhanced awareness on wildlife conservation too. And Port is a cent to act as a center for conducting scientific studies on the fauna. And fifth is to provide educative and recreational facility for the people of the state. Our zoological park comprises only, it covers only 20% of the total park of the area. So we have a vast expanse of wilderness, which has been maintained inside our zoological park as reserve forest. And this forest is a home to a varied of number of ranging birds, butterflies, mammals, and reptiles. We have an inventory survey on butterflies and free ranging birds too, which was taken during the past years, which reported the conclusive presence of more, almost 200 species of butterflies, and species of birds from within the park, as well as in its near its close vicinity. These are some of our endangered species of animals and reptiles and primates which are found in our zoo. The first is wild dog, dhol. Second is royal Bengal tiger, black soft shell turtle, western hollow gibbon, Burmese black mountain tortoise, and nil box turtle. The royal Bengal tiger is the flagship species of our zoo. And um, this is the main attraction of for a visitor for uh, in our zoo. Tiger is, as we know, is a national animal of India, and at present, Nagaland has one tigress. Another flagship species of our zoo is Himalayan black bear, which uh, in which the conservation status is vulnerable, and we have quite a good number of black bear, Himalayan black bear, in our zoo. Western hollow gibbon is also one of the flagship species which is found in our zoo. And this hollow gibbon is the India only F species, which is uh, also found in Nagaland, native to Nagaland, and it is also one of the main attractions for our visitors in the zoo. Indian wild dog, as we know, is, a, as, is also known as Asiatic wild dog, red dog, or whistling dog. They are also found in our zoo. They are quite elusive and skill jumper, as they're also classified with wolves, coyotes, jackals, and foxes in the taxonomic Canidia. They are incredible athletic fast runners, and their skills are critical when the packs is hunting. So we also have in some product areas, they also share habitat with tigers and leopards. These are some of the conservation breeding which are being initiated in our Zoo. The first is Asian brown tortoise. Another is oriental pied hornbill, and third is split striker pen. Regarding this Asian brown tortoise, which is also known as Monoria, and is the species which uh, is which we are having a conservation program, and it. The Island Zoological Park it is the only zoo in the country that has been successfully hatching this species in captivity which is also a part of captive breeding program or project in collaboration with Turtle Survival Alliance India. This 
Conservation breeding is quite successful, as I should say, because uh, we have a, around a 78 Asian brown tortoise, like where 10 of them got hatched out in 2018 and 68 hatched out in 2019. Oriental pied hornbill, hornbill is also one of the uh, species which um, is also we used to do cons uh, this conservation breeding program for them. And we have a good number of oriental pied hornbill and has been successfully breeding um, this species. Our zoo has been successfully breeding this species for the past years. The program highlights of this uh, oriental pied hornbill conservation breeding is, is basically conservation breeding plus rescue and keeping in captivity to ensure the survival as well as community awareness and capacity building. As we all know, this our plight recovery is the species of the week for this uh, program. So this plate, Dragovan, we have one conservation center, which is at Kohima. Uh, of late, the state has witnessed a kind of drastic decline in the sighting of this split Dragovan, which once roamed the higher altitude of the region among the thick canopy of auks, rhododendrons, and friends. But um, due to the twin, twin thing, uh, decreased number of these birds in the wild, there was a need for to conserve these vulnerable species. So the Forest Department Nagaland, in collaboration with the Central Zoo Authority of India, has set up this Leeds Dragovan Conservation and Breeding Center in the year 2012, which is solely for the conservation and breeding of Leeds Dragovan. So the main objective, as we know, for the program is the conservation breeding of Leeds Dragovan in the breeding center and with the possibility of reintroducing it to back to its natural home range and strengthen its wild population. The another objective is to carry out some model research on their habitat, their behavior, as well as their breeding biology in captivity to ensure their survival, as well as to induce natural breeding. At present, there are around 14 individuals which are housed, housed at our breeding center we have uh, around 11 adults and three chicks. Uh, from there, we have uh, seven, 11 adults. We have consists of seven male and four female. The conservation breeding of Please Recovery uh, from our Please Recovery Conservation and Breeding Center at Kohima, we have uh, this uh, kind of say like it's successful uh, from one point of view because uh, to get a chick from natural uh, incubation is quite difficult, but it was first in 2016, there was a successful hatching out of dragoban chicks by natural breeding and the chicks survive till today. And that is one of the big achievement for our breeding center. And in 2020, we are able to um, have, we are able to hatch out one chick, which is still um, surviving and Latest report is 2021. We have three chicks, which was which has hatched out naturally. Uh, two is female and one is male, and they are surviving till now. So these are some of the uh, uh, some of the activities which are being uh, done during the breeding season for our dragoban, please dragoban, like uh, the nesting preparation, how we used to collect the ferns, mosses, and leaves from the forest and put uh, and make the nest in such a way, in such a way like na natural way so that the birds are able to nest in it. And this all we used to do during mostly in the month of uh, January, uh, March, January to February. And because the uh, mating starts from March, April. And these are some of the nests which we have prepared and then it is kept for nesting. And we usually have a taking also once the chicks comes out, we need for identification. These are some of the process which we usually do in our breeding center. Uh, these are the species collections which are found in our Nagaland Zoological Park. The endangered species birds we don't have, but others and other than endangered species, we have 15 species. Mammals, we have three endangered species and 17 are other than endangered species, they are non-endangered species. Reptiles, we have three endangered species and 
other than non-endangered species are eight. So altogether, six endangered species and 40 non-endangered species are found in our collection in our zoo. The total number of species in the collection is 46 and the total population is 361. Thank you. I request if each, each and every one of you, all the participants, if there is any question that we can discuss. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much Amanda, for giving a brief uh, you know, overview of the zoo as well as of the conservation breeding programs being undertaken at the zoo. Uh, we will take question and answers for this session right now. So uh, the first question for you, ma'am, is that um, are any particular species of plants used for making the nests that you have mentioned for the blight straggle? Yes, uh, basically like we used to collect some plants. Um, I will tell you the species name that is uh, we use usually debris folia. This species also we usually use. Along with that, we use ferns that we that is available in our uh, forest area, most of our forested area. And apart from that, in the cages we used to have this mulberry also plant uh, the fruits well all right and this next question for you ma'am is that uh, presently are there any studies being done on any of the species which are part of the conservation breeding program at your zoo uh, please track open Yes, means any any of the species which Apart are in your conservation breeding program. I think yes, yes. If there are any uh, studies being done in cap of, on in the captive interest. Yeah, we are use, doing mostly this oriental pied hornbill. So like we are trying to breed them by our uh, with our limited knowledge that we have from our side, and uh, it was successful. We could hatch out naturally. Uh, some few chicks we have hatched out in the past years. And this year also, also we are making the nest box and all and giving them the kind of uh, program, like we are arranging them for mating purpose because this is basically the mating season in April. So we take care of their diet, giving them more source of good source of protein and whatever available from our site, we used to provide them. So hopefully even that oriental pipe hornbill also, we are trying our best to half of this conservation breeding in our zoo. Right, ma'am. And the next next question for you is that are there any uh, aven awareness or educational activities that are done by uh, done at the zoo level for visitors? Yes, yes, we have information booth also. Most of the time uh, we it is men by my staffs out here where the visitors are being uh, if there is any inf uh, information related to the zoo if they want to ask they can always go and they can ask in that information booth and not only that we usually keep some kind of questionnaires also for the visitors to give us the feedback that also we used to do and we have have a, a conference hall where we used to bring the children and all whenever they come in big numbers uh, initially we used to show them some kind of uh, uh, pictures or i mean our uh, zoo uh, some small clippings then only we would used to send them to the zoo inside and apart from there we uh, usually arrange some kind of uh, this awareness campaign among the awareness program with the school students by calling them to the zoo and then giving them awareness sometimes the eco clubs and all they'll come and they'll help us in cleaning their zoo also and in that way we used to uh, give them awareness uh, in that way we interact clean we will clean the camp premises also and most of the time we used to do every or uh, one after one month or two months, we usually have that conservation uh, awareness program among the people here, among the students, especially with the college students also. Right, ma'am. And ma'am, though I think the final question for you is since Nagaland's logical park is the only zoo in Nagaland, is there what is the main attraction for visitors who come to the zoo? Is there any particular place or exhibit that they prefer or anything like that if you'd like to share? Yeah, actually our zoo, um our, our people are very much um they have uh, affinity to they like to 
can see that tiger mostly our here. So that is basically not a native species of ours, but they really like to come and see the tigers. And then other main attraction is the hollow gibbon, as I've said, that is the only ape species in India native to our state. So hollow gibbon is also quite a main attraction for the our visitors out here. And another is hornbill. We have hornbills. So these are the three main attractive, I mean, uh, visit, visitors find it very uh, attracted towards to, uh, when they come and visit our zoo. All right, ma'am. And we have one more question for you, which is that uh, what are the future plans for the zoo? The future plans for our zoo is that like we really want to strengthen our infrastructure also. Most of the infrastructures are still in uh, kind of most uh, it was made before. So the infrastructure and we also want to I would also like to share with you all that we are likely to bring uh, Gharel soon from under animal exchange program Ozu. I think it will come in the next week. So uh, these are one of uh, new animals are going to be added to our zoo. And for me, the uh, I mean, I wanted to uh, we want to have a very good information center. The future, I mean, in the in the next future days to come, if um, we are being provided with like the funding and the infrastructure, then we would like to have a very good information system, uh, information center where all the people can come and uh, first visit before visiting it, they'll get some kind of first hand knowledge and they will go inside the zoo. And there, uh, uh, there are so many uh, other than that, um, like uh, the kind of uh, works like renovation works or so many things. For up uh, for increasing the, I mean, for keeping the animal in a better condition, we I would like to have that all in my zoo. Right, ma'am, and I think we have one last question, which is I think a subset of the earlier question that was asked on outreach. So it says that uh, does the zoo conduct any outreach program for communities involved with, say, the tragopans and hornbills who are like in I think close yes. proximity? So if you can, if you'd like to add something to it. Yes, yes. This uh, Dragobin Breeding Center is located in Kohima. Our zoo is located in Dimapur, but um, we are really we work in close uh, closely with each other. But uh, this uh, Dragobin Breeding uh, Center, we for that we usually for the please Dragobin uh, keeping in view, we usually have a kind of community interaction also mostly, and sometimes we call them to our center also. We let them visit our Dragobin Breeding Center and share with them the knowledge, little knowledge that we have and whatever indigenous knowledge they have for this um, zoo, I mean, for the birds, they also share with us. In that way, we share each other uh, knowledge about the Blitz Dracoban also. And then uh, many a times, like uh, we also invite them for, uh, a com for having a conservation awareness program with the villagers, with the community. Sometimes we go and also visit them and if there is any expert coming all the way from the other countries to our state, for especially for this Dracoban bird, it is the zoo which initiated the process to take them to the community conserved areas. So we had a close relationship. We always had an interaction with the community people out here over for this conservation of birds. Right, ma'am. So I think those were the questions for the zoo part. That is your talk. And uh, if the audience has any questions for the Know Your Species, which is on the Blight Stragopan, then Dr. Rahul has already conveyed that do write in to him if you have any questions on the species as such or any anything that you'd like to ask him particularly. And with this, we come to the end of our 52nd Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. So on behalf of CZD, I would like to thank both Dr. Rahul and to you, Dr. Zupini, for taking time out of your schedule and joining us for this talk and I would also like to thank the audience who have been with us throughout for this talk session and would like to inform them that we will be back next week uh, with our week 53rd talk which will be on the greater one-horned rhinoceros and uh, as the species in focus and the center for wildlife rehabilitation and conservation as the zoo in focus so do tune in to that talk also next Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m and Nagaland Zoological Park will be continuing the outreach activities till the end of this week so if you're in Nagaland do, do take part in their activities as well. Thank you so much. Namaskar.